Occult Confessions is brought to you commercial free through the general support of our patrons. Visit occultconfessions.com and click on donate to help keep the history of the occult on the digital airwaves. I think it's generous, not general, right? Did you say the general support of our patrons? <laughs> I did say that. Did I say that? I'm pretty sure, but maybe I just misheard it. No, good catch. I wasn't paying attention. I was getting ready for the opening. <laughs> the general support. They generally support us, not specifically. I, I just feel like there's a difference, but I don't there's know. a difference. But it, it's funny. <laughs> we'll do it again. Uh, maybe I'll just leave it with this whole conversation afterwards. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Deep underground, a race of humans has evolved separately, having split off from us above grounders at the time of the deluge, also known as Noah's Flood. This race has perfected the use of Viril, V R I L, Viril, a quasi mystical force that can be used to hypnotize, heal, fly, and decimate whole cities. Written in 1871, Edward Bulwer Lytton's Vril, or The Coming Race, tackled questions of eugenics and weapons of mass destruction 70 years before they would both result in the deaths of millions during the Second World War. A strange little book, The Coming Race spends most of its time laying out the various facets of the Anna, or people of the Vril, after the narrator's discovery of this hidden society during a sort of mining expedition. The narrator is amazed and impressed by this seemingly superior society for the better part of the novel, until it begins to dawn on him that these seemingly perfected people with their seemingly ideal society are in fact deeply flawed in ways that could spell the destruction of our own race up here on the Earth's surface. In the realm of occultism, this book left a mark, as Lytton had done before with his novel Zanoni. The mark, that is, on the theory and practice of magic. The historian Jocelyn Godwin says that, as far as esotericism in Victorian Britain is concerned, there is no more important literary work than Zanoni and no more important figure than Bulwer Lytton. Lytton's fictional race possessed a set of religious beliefs curiously similar to the ones outlined by Helena Blavatsky for her Theosophical Society, and mirroring at least some of what Blavatsky would say about the lost continent of Atlantis more than a decade later. The existence of Vril, a force underlying and uniting all other forces that govern the universe, also became a popular topic among scientists. Einstein famously sought it in his search for a theory of everything. But Eastern-inspired occult revivalists and New Agers ascribing to belief in a fundamental unity, holding the universe together, are also very interested in something like Vril. My name is Rob C. Thompson. I am the supreme hierophant of the secret order of alchemical actors. I am joined this day by James Caplanges, our captain of the table. Hello, everybody. And Olivia Litterall, Grand Master of the Order. Hello. Welcome back to you both. How is life? Sweaty. Uh. (laughs) It did warm up. It got suddenly very warm. Maryland, we were enjoying... Nice temperate spring for a while, a little bit rainy. Now, it's just summer. Spring's over. That's how it works, though, right? Yeah, mid-Atlantic region. We have, like, early summer, and then it goes back to spring, and then it's, like, summer again. Now, James, you had some thoughts, uh, because we are going to be discussing Lord Bulwer today, Lord Edward Bulwer Lytton. Now, uh, are you comfortable discussing his lordship in, in those terms? No, actually, uh, thanks for asking, Rob. Um, I'm not comfortable. <laughs> I think I will just refer to him as Mr. Lytton. <laughs> I call no man lord. I'm sorry. <laughs> is, is this no disrespect? Is this an American thing? Like you know, we don't we don't hang with the nobility in in the in the colonies. You know, I got to say, Rob, this is something about myself I've never really analyzed. <laughs> you know, it's just been really deep rooted. And uh, you're holding a mirror up to me for the first time, and I'm going to have to take some time to think about it. Now, how about when Lord was big? You know what I'm talking about? That pop music singer? Oh, with the E? Yeah, that's fine. That's all right. Lord's off. <laughs> you will call her Lord. Yeah. Okay, all right. That's her name. No, Man Lord, you would call. No, I'll call no Man Lord. <laughs> Let's pledge it out. 
We the members of the, of the secret, secret order, order and our chemical actors, actors do solemnly commit ourselves, ourselves to a full and honest telling of the history of the, history of the occult, occult as, far as far as we know it. All right, lovely. Uh, Olivia, you know what to do? Plug, plug, plug? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay, I was for sec- I, I wasn't here for a week or something. I'm I'm confused. It's kind of also, delightful. Also, you never you never just throw it at me like that. <laughs> no, that's true. But I like it as a question. <laughs> I think yeah. it works. Thank you. <laughs> Let's talk about our patrons today. Let's bring them into the fold. Uh, we got a nice healthy list yet again. Santiago T, Brittany Q, Brit W, Degner G, D T S, Thomas C. Casey R, Jessica B, MX Misty, and we had a pledge bump from Tim G. A little bit of love for them. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Got to keep it going, friends. Uh, Naturally, uh, as the economy opens up, and and, uh, let me say that differently, as the economy is ever shifting in the Western world, (laughs) we we have folks who are able to add, folks who are are leaving the Patreon. So uh, we do like to to keep that list nice and strong and and, uh, moving along. And we are providing new content all the time. Uh, Second plug for the day is going to be for our friend Luke Kinneman, who opened up our Discord Thanks, Luke. Yes. I'm enjoying it. I think it's fun. Uh, I'm interacting yeah. with the listeners, uh, all, all the confessors out there in ways that I hadn't before. Olivia's on there. How's, how's it going, Olivia? I'm figuring it out. I kind of just lurk and stalk all of you. <laughs> uh, I like my name, though. That's fun. Who are but you again? Occult Olives. Occult Olives. Delightful. Just, just a bowl of, of spooky <laughs> olives. That's so- what I am. <laughs> If you join the Patreon, there are uh, certain Patreon channels within the Discord, but the Discord is also open to the public because, uh, you know, we, we like to have all the confessors able to interact. Uh, so we, we encourage you to join us on Discord. Uh, we're also producing new content all the time for Patreon. Uh, both Olivia and Brie are going to be producing episodes for us this year. Uh, and there are already hours and hours of uh, episodes on there for you to check out. So please... Hop over to that Patreon and and join us for as little as a dollar a month or $12 a year. Finally, I would like to plug uh, (laughs) a couple of things baked into one here. Occult Confessions is moving into its summer season, and uh, our summer season is going to be a little different this year because I have baby news. Baby Baby news. news. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) So, yes, Katie and I will be having our second and final child. Uh, Yes, yes, I know uh, Brian out there, Brian, our listener, who is a big fan of, um, what's his face, Uh, Terrence McKenna. I am one child above my limit. That's Uh, true. Yeah. I wasn't going to say it, but I'm glad someone did. (laughs) But in my defense, the birth rate is down in the uh, the United States. So uh, we're going to even out, Katie and I. We're going to go one for one. Nice. So we are expecting our child in July, uh, and I am delighted to share that with all of our confessors out there. Uh, what that means is not that I am going to be stepping away, which I did two years ago, three years ago. Oh my goodness, we've been doing this for a while. Mm-hmm. Three years ago, when my first child was born, we actually went away for about a month, six weeks maybe. Uh, we're not doing that. We are pre-recording the summer, so there will be no interruption in service for you all. And in fact, many of you will be able to continue to interact with me on Discord. I think <laughs> that's called family planning. Family planning. Yes, that's that's exactly right, James. So <laughs> uh, the caveat, I guess, to all this is that you know the Patreon, the patron bumps, and all that that we talk about, the uh, order of confessors talking about reviews. This is going to be the last time that I'm able to do that for a little while. Uh, and you know, maybe a couple episodes over the summer, we'll record closer to the time so we can get caught up on that, but it might not be till August that we actually, uh, catch up on things. Speaking of August, that's going to be Olivia's month <laughs> this, this Woo! year. <laughs> month of Olivia. Yeah. So well, Olivia's going to be flipping it for, uh, the entire month of August for us. That's and, uh, a lot of whiplash, but yeah, a lot of whiplash. Well, yeah, we're living in whiplash right now. We're wearing masks one day, mm. the next day we're not wearing masks. Valid. COVID's going to kill us. It's not going to kill us. A lot of whiplash in the month of May. (laughs) All right, close up those plugs, Olivia. Plug, plug, plug. All right, then. Uh, Let's get into Edward Bulwer Lytton, shall we? Mr. Lytton. Mr. Lytton. As James would prefer. 
Eddie uh, is one of the most important figures in Victorian occultism, who you've probably never heard of, in part because Lord Lytton was a man before his time. Lytton was born on the 25th of May, 1803. How about that? This is a timely episode. And <laughs> moved to London when he was only four years old, much like Olivia. Yep. <laughs> Can't you tell? It's a weird year in your life, right? Yeah. <laughs> so... I'm I'm lying, of course. He ran successfully. He did not move to London. Olivia did. He ran successfully for a seat on the British Parliament in 1831 as one, and was created a baronet in 1838, roughly the same year James was created a baronet. Yes. But James also doesn't like to be called Lord James. So, um, Rob, I just have one question. Yes. What's a baronet? <laughs> well... Yeah, I, I don't. I can't really answer that. I, I, here's what I can tell you, James. Because the nobility is a complex hierarchy, a baronet is somewhere between a king and uh, what's on the bottom there. I mean, is I it like know. baron? Is it a baron a title? <laughs> yeah, you're called baron. So okay, he's the title, like baron, baronet, or like yes, something. yeah, he's oh, Baron well, Edward Bowler Lytton. Oh, I see. Yeah, so we like call a social status thing. Yeah, we would call anyone a lord who is in the nobility, uh, but okay. his specific title would be Baron Edward, just like you have Count Dracula and yes, I see. <laughs> Count <laughs> Count <laughs> the Duke of Earl. Yeah, all those famous guys, <laughs> right. the Earl of Sandwich. So <clears throat> a Baron's just one of those. After a long break from politics, he became Secretary of State for the Colonies in 1858. That's not us, because we're not a colony by 1858 here in the U.S. Uh, so basically, yeah, India, mostly India. Although Lytton was certainly very invested in politics, his true passion was his writing. Lord Melbourne offered him the Lordship of the Admiralty during his nine-year stint in Parliament, but Lytton declined, at least in part because his interests were elsewhere than British politics. So that's a pretty powerful gig, being Lord of the Admiralty. He said, no thanks. I'd like to write books instead. This guy's priorities in order. Right? I could be a, a U.S. Senator right now, but I said, you know what? I want to have a podcast. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly you what know? happened. He knows what he wants. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, the offer was made. I just said, no, yeah. I'm not into that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> His literary contributions to the culture are perhaps best seen in phrases. He's contributed a number of phrases to our popular lexicon. Those include the classic Gothic opening, It Was a Dark and Stormy Night. Oh. Also the pithy, The Pen is Mightier Than the Sword, which is often oh. mistakenly attributed to Shakespeare. Yeah, that's what I thought. Huh. Yeah. yeah, I think I was taught that in school. Yeah. Lies. <laughs> I think I got taught that in my Shakespeare class. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep, that's Lytton. Uh, also, uh, The Pursuit of the Almighty Dollar. That's him. And my personal favorite, The Great Unwashed. Oh, that's... Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gross. But the, the reason many of you are hearing about Lytton for the first time right now is that his literary reputation is somewhat fraught. His name graces a bizarre contest for the worst first line in an imaginary novel, referencing his now cliche but widely copied dark and stormy night. What do you mean imaginary novel? So if you, you come up with a, a... The contest is you, you come up with an imaginary novel and you write a, the worst first line you could think of to start your imaginary novel. That's the whole and thing? That's the contest? It's a, it's a weird contest, yeah. And it's called the Mr. Litton Award? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's, that's pretty cool. Uh -huh. So mocking Litton is, in my opinion, uh, more than a little unfair. Scoffers going to scoff, particularly when we're talking about occult-inclined writers and thinkers. Although Litton is not generally regarded as a great novelist today, his creative contributions are substantial, particularly in the area of the literary occult. He arguably created a genre when he wrote the first occult novel, Zanoni, a book that popularized occult themes for a whole generation of magical practitioners in the late Victorian age. Lytton was one of a vanguard of cultural figures to popularize occult themes in the English-speaking world, paving the way for the occult revival with the Golden Dawn and Aleister Crowley and the Theosophical Society and everything that's come since. This guy needs some credit. We talked about Zanoni before, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. in, uh, in our first series. Right, okay, that's why it's mm -hmm. familiar, got it. Yeah, Emma, Emma Harding Britton, who got an episode in our yeah. very first series, was... Uh, arguably knew Edward Bulwer Lytton because she's from England before she emigrated to the United States. And uh, she probably practiced in an occult circle with him. Mm, 
Didn't we talk about somebody who published that book? Zanoni? Yeah. Yes, we'll get there. <laughs> Hold that thought. Uh, where, where, yeah, where, where the origins of the book. So Lytton is, in my opinion, denigrated by some scoffers because so much of his work was devoted to occult and magical themes, which our serious secularist postmodern literati tend to regard as unserious. Certainly, Lytton's work can lean on the melodramatic side, but so can his contemporaries like Charles Dickens or even Edgar Allan Poe. The heart, True. the terrible beating of the heart, right? Yeah. Oliver Twist. But- Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> and his work offers up real complex explorations of difficult questions about the soul and the state of the future of humanity, which I am going to prove to you all today. You ready for this? Yep. Let's start with our man Zanoni. Lytton gets his occult reputation, at least in part, through some intentional blurring of the lines between fiction and reality, particularly in Zanoni, which led many to believe he was a practicing occultist. One Rosicrucian order went so far as to name him an honorary grand patron. We need that title for one of our actors, yeah. honorary grand patron. Or one of our <laughs> patrons? patrons? Ooh, yeah. A lucky yeah. listener. We'll have a contest. Grand patron. One, one lucky honorary grand patron. Oh, one yes. lucky listener will become an honorary grand patron. Hmm. Ooh, let's work that out. That'll be fun for the summer. You guys go do that while I'm having a baby. Great. I'll add that to August. <laughs> Let me know who wins. <laughs> well, you can tell me on the episode in August. <laughs> so. Nice. The outline for Zanoni first came to Lytton in a dream. An early draft was published in the Monthly Chronicle under the title Zichi. Not so catchy. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad he switched it to Zanoni. Zichi sounds like like a kind of pasta or something. Lytton believed... What? (laughs) Sorry, I was going to say Zanoni sounds like something you'd clean like uh, ice rink It's almost (laughs) like... What is the name of the family in Holes? Because it sounds like almost like that. What is their name? James, do you know? Zambelli? It's like something? almost Zamboni, isn't it? Or something? Yeah, it's, 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 is yeah. that purposeful? Zambelli? It's been a while. It's been in a while. the YA novel? Can someone that's <laughs> yeah. watched Holes recently please let me know? Thank you. Oh, it's a movie. Oh, well, there's... They made a movie out of it. What's Shia LaBeouf? Dig yeah, it up Shia from LaBeouf. Holes. No? Okay. Yeah, it, it's what got me to eat onions for the first oh, time. Oh, God. Kiss me, Kate, or whatever, or not kiss me, Kate. Well, that's a musical. What is her yes, name? Yes, it's Cole Porter. <laughs> her, her name is Kiss Me, Kate. No, it's something. <laughs> what is her name? I don't remember. Anyway, Kiss M. Kate. So <clears throat> Lytton believed there was nothing like Zanoni in the English language, and that it would be, and I'm quoting here, no favorite with the English public, who he considered that largest of all asses. Maybe this is why people didn't like him. the the novel's introduction tells the story of how Lytton made friends with a mysterious Rosicrucian brother in an occult bookshop in Covent Garden and that the Rosicrucian later left Lytton a collection of manuscripts after his death this is what you were talking about right James yeah yeah so this is the secret origins of Zanoni and we yeah we we went over that a little bit in the Rosicrucian episode I guess yeah uh, maybe yeah he's come up here and there so it's it's about time he got his own episode Lytton had to first translate the manuscripts from a cipher and then edit them for a reading public, and he presents Zanoni as the product of these labors. He employs other tricks to render his Zanoni as believable as possible despite its fantastic story. For example, he holds back the name of certain characters, marking an underscore where the names might otherwise be. So you see like a blank. Mm. Count blank came from my throat. You got me? Yeah, it makes him mysterious and scary. Right. Uh, He doesn't name this particular dastardly prince who abducts and attempts to rape the romantic heroine of the novel, even though the prince is a significant character in the novel's first half. This suggests that a real person may stand behind that character and that Bulwer Lytton is attempting to avoid charges of slander from the man or his family. Right? If he was fictional, why would you disguise his name? More potently... He includes real historical figures like Maximilien de Robespierre and the other French revolutionaries rooting the story of Zanoni in some of the actual history of the Reign of Terror in France. And he drops footnoted sources for the title character's various theories and practices, suggesting a real basis for the events detailed in the novel. So all this makes us feel like it's not just a novel. 
until we get to the end. Uh, so for all these clever devices, the story is just too much for us to believe. Zanoni, the novel's hero, is an ancient Chaldean. A Chalde- James, you know about the Chaldeans? You're into ancient no, cultures. Oh, wait. From Chaldea? No, we just <laughs> talked about them in my class. Did you really? No, we did. Oh, oh my God. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, this is my well, chance to, to prove say- knowledge, and I don't have it. <laughs> I'll just say broadly, and if you have any things to add, you can. Chaldeans are just one of the ancient cultures, like the Babylonians or the Assyrians. They got the Chaldeans. They came out of the, the little fertile crescent area over there. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to add anything, Olivia? No, because I can't remember why we talked <laughs> about them in my heretics class now. But we, in the very beginning, when we were talking about like the beginning of the Iberian Peninsula and shit, we talked about them, but I can't remember why. Well, if it comes to you, just shout it out. It won't interrupt me at all. I'll just keep going. Yeah, well. <laughs> Anyway, he's an ancient Chaldean. He's lived for thousands of years, uh, having discovered with his brother Mejnur the alchemical elixir of life, which has allowed them both to live a hell of a long time. His occult power is rooted in his detachment from earthly things, and he begins to lose this power when he falls in love with and marries Viola, a beautiful young opera singer who is named after a string instrument. (laughs) That's... (laughs) I think it's intentional. Her father was like a a viola player, I think. It just named her after the... Yeah. That's a little vain. (laughs) Right? I didn't name my kid Occult Confessions. So... Right? (laughs) Occult Confessions Thompson. Oh, my God. (laughs) I still have a chance. I I could still do that. (laughs) (laughs) After giving birth to Zanoni's child, Viola leaves the safety of their Mediterranean villa and ends up in Paris in the midst of the Reign of Terror where she is threatened with the guillotine. Zanoni sacrifices himself in a truly complex bit of political maneuvering, taking his wife's place on the scaffold. This was a plot point that would later inspire Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. So it was Bulwer Lytton who came up with the end of Tale of Two Cities, not Charles Dickens. But not before successfully conspiring to end Robespierre's tyranny. So uh, what I'm saying there is that Zanoni, (laughs) before he takes the scaffold personally orchestrates the conclusion of Robespierre's reign of terror. (laughs) Big stuff. Zanoni overcomes his fear of death and continues on to the next phase of his existence, liberated from his terrestrial body. So it's actually kind of clever. Uh, I mean, Bulwer Lytton, he's a lord, right, as as we've been poking fun at. Uh, But the British nobility were not a big fan of what was going on in France. They were on board with, you know, constitutional government and all, but just murdering people left and right, they found that a little gauche. (laughs) So, in bad taste. Frowned upon. It's it's frowned upon, yeah. It's frowned upon in the the United Kingdom. So... (laughs) He was not, so he wrote that Zanoni in part to criticize what was happening in France. And part of the criticism was this idea that, you know, they had created this culture of death. So what Zanoni accomplishes, this sort of ancient noble, is to overcome not only his own fear of death, but France's death obsession, the death grip that is on France of, you know, these revolutionaries. So he personally... Uh, undermines all of this. He he overcomes death on these various levels, and he saves his wife's life. So there's like a it's like a triple thing here of his of him overcoming death. He's a powerful character. Yeah, I, I think I, I really do think Lytton is he's an underrated guy. It, it, his books have there's there's just interesting intellectual puzzles in them like that. Like if you can if you really think about it, it's a little goofy, but it's kind of clever. Yeah, I'm already kind of looking back on that that uh award that you told us about about people writing like the worst opening lines and they call it they like put his name on the award that's kind of like that's kind of messed up yeah it's, it's not very fair. messed up yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's a smart it's guy bullying, really <laughs> he's being bullied by the future right yeah. <laughs> it's unfair <laughs> when we start our pop band i think that should be our first song bullied by the future yo that is such a good name <laughs> well, now, yeah. Believe by the future. He's getting much future now. I want to call it confessions. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, TM. You can't take it. I feel like when we start our alt right pop rock band, "Bullied by the Future" is the perfect oh name of our first our album. Right? 
<laughs> Wouldn't it be? That's Don't let yourself be bullied by the future. It is a very, uh, yeah, anarchist. <laughs> right? <laughs> Anyhow, in Zanoni, uh, Lytton develops an occult principle that has stood the test of time. Let's get to some occultism, shall we? Okay. It's another of his long-standing phrases. It's the dweller of the threshold, or the dweller on the threshold. Oh, you guys, have you heard of this? I remember I did the voice the first time we did this. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember this. We got Luke doing it this time. We're about to good, hear him. Good, good. <laughs> The occultist prepares by surrendering all earthly and terrestrial desires in order to confront and overcome the dweller. Here's what the dweller says to the approaching initiate. Go ahead, Luke. Thou hast entered the immeasurable region. I am the dweller of the threshold. What wouldst thou with me? Silent? Dost thou fear me? Am I not thy beloved? It is not for me that thou hast rendered up the delights of thy race. Wouldst thou be wise? Mine is the wisdom of the countless ages. Kiss me, my mortal lover. In a moment, a young, ill-prepared novice fails the test and just passes out. But successfully facing down the dweller renders the occultist a master of life and essentially immortal. This in turn becomes its own dweller, its own block on the path to true enlightenment. So you overcome the dweller by overcoming your attachments, but then you get trapped by your obsession with being immortal. You see what I mean? In order to become a true master, the occultist must also master, that is to say embrace, death. So you can't be afraid of death and avoiding death. You have to allow death to come. It sounds hard for somebody whose goal is to get away from death. Yeah. Yeah, if you fought that hard to be immortal, to then have to give it up. You probably care a bit. Yeah. I feel like in general, that's like humans' probably biggest fear is death, right? That's like the biggest hurdle to get over anyway. That and public speaking. (laughs) <laughs> well, very inexchangeable, you're right. <laughs> we we yeah. can't identify with those public speaking people. Zanoni's angelic guide Adonai explains this principle. Thy courage has restored thy power. Once more in the haunts of the earth, thy soul charms me to thy side. Wiser now, in the moment when thou comprehendest death, than when thy unfettered spirit learns the solemn mystery of life. The human affections that thralled and humbled thee, a while bring to thee, in these last hours of thy mortality, the sublimest heritage of thy race, the eternity that commences from the grave. The notion that one's own internal demons can be assigned a counterpart in the magical or ethereal world, which may or may not be an extension of the individual's own subconscious anyhow, is a hallmark of occultism stretching through Aleister Crowley to the chaos magicians. And in 1841, it's very clearly outlined in the pages of this novel that is today, sadly, seldom read. But did Lytton really know such a bookshop owner? Did he really meet a Rosicrucian brother? And was he really entrusted with the task of cracking Zanoni's cipher? The scholar Godwin says that, With the possible exception of the Dweller of the Threshold, much of what Lytton has to say in Zanoni he could have learned secondhand. In other words, he could have picked it up from books he didn't have to actually practice. Mm -hmm. That having been said, Godwin believes that Lytton probably belonged to a crystal and mirror-gazing group between 1830 and 1860, and that he had undergone a series of first-hand experiences beginning with studies in his grandfather's library and his connection with the mesmerist Chauncey Hare Townsend. He met this particular character at his preparatory school. I can't name all the characters I met at my preparatory school. How about you guys? Nah, just the mesmerists. Similar, really. Yeah, all those mesmerists coming and going at preparatory school. My goodness. (laughs) (laughs) We were all educated in a ditch. Uh, (laughs) The truth. (laughs) The mud people taught us. So... In his biography of his grandfather, Victor Alexander George Robert Bulwer Lytton, second Earl of Lytton. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, with full access to his namesake's letters, pretty much agrees with Godwin's conclusions. First, the second Earl of Lytton says that according to his grandfather, 
Debbie, the old magic bookseller in Zanoni, was a reality. He is dead. He goes on to say, I have ample proof that his study of occult subjects, meaning granddad's uh, study, was serious and discriminating, and that traces uh, of this bent of mind should be apparent in his books is natural enough. He certainly did not study magic for the sake of writing about it, still less that he did he write about it without having studied it. So, a couple of sources telling us that we have a real occultist on our hands. Lytton spent some time investigating spiritualism, mediums, that is to say, communicating with the spirits of the dead. This was then a craze in the United Kingdom, and it had started in America. Lytton, however, was unimpressed. They profess to be spirits of the dead, but I much doubt supposing they are spirits at all, whether they are not rather brownies or fairies. They are never to be relied on for accurate answers, though sometimes they were wonderfully so, just like clairvoyance. Altogether, it is as startling. In general, Lytton was more willing to believe in non-human spirits than human ones. These spirits in his mind suggested a much older tradition than the newfangled phenomena of spiritualism. There may be intermediate beings of mixed nature, not deliberately evil, nor steadily benevolent, uncertain, and only able to get at crude and imperfect report with humanity. There are agencies of communication which no philosophy has yet solved, but which bear out the universal and immemorial traditions of mankind, and are analogous to the boasted powers which the philosophical magician of old assumed. Death for Lytton is an insurmountable and inevitable part of living, and as Zanoni demonstrates, fear of death is no reason to pursue an occult program. Lytton is suspicious of systems that separate human beings from the pain and passion of their lives. The cycle of life and death and the desires that pull us from moment to moment and quest to quest are central to what it means to be human in Lytton's various imagined universes. Zanoni is trapped in a kind of prison of immortality before he allows himself to love a woman deeply and truly enough to sacrifice himself. Zanoni's love for Viola liberates him from the trap of eternal life, freeing him from his material body. To attempt to get above or beyond the passions of this life, as some Eastern religions, most famously Buddhism, tend to teach, is in Lytton's view a foray into a pipe dream or illusion. The seemingly liberated is just imprisoned by other means. Ooh, yeah. That's yeah. deep. Before we go on, I, I think it's interesting. I actually didn't have this thought while I was writing this, but we have to bear in mind he was a minister to the colonies, right? Yeah. India. So I'd imagine he's been there. Uh, I, yeah. So, I mean, he had a lot of relations with India, and I can feel a lot of Indian philosophy in here. I mean, the notion that the sensuous or sensual is part of life, that we need to be fully immersed in the sensual and, you know, have a responsibility to society and a responsibility to the spirit. That's a very Indian idea, very Hindu idea. And then, you know, like I'm talking about with the Buddhism here, there's a lot of Indian philosophy in Zanoni and in the coming race. Shall we go to the coming race? Why not? I'm ready. It's <laughs> coming. It's coming. <laughs> <sighs> it's just an early version of the Kentucky Derby. What? <laughs> <laughs> I believed you for a second. I thought you were telling truths. God. <laughs> well, we got the Preakness right here in Baltimore. <laughs> okay, so no, for real, the coming race, the word race here refers to a race of beings. It's really the coming species, uh, because they're not just a race of humans, as we'll find out. All these ideas are clearest in one of Bulwer Lytton's final works, published three decades later than Zanoni in 1871. This is called The Coming Race, which was later retitled Vril or The Coming Race. So the concept of Vril, I know that many of our, our confessors are hearing this for the first time. It, it, it was a very influential idea in 1871. It, it, it took on a life of its own, so much so that they would retitle the novel, you know, brand it with Vril. It's kind of, I kind of like that. It's like a choose your own title. <laughs> yes. like Vril or The Coming Race. Like, which one? And You know, believe it or not, I was doing research on, for an episode much later in the year, and it was, a, it was a conspiracy theorist was talking about Vril and how aliens manipulate Vril for various purposes. So it's still kicking around out there. Are you about to explain what, what the fuck you're talking about? What, what's well, Vril? I kind of did at the beginning, but yes, I will. I will. Okay, because 
confusion here. Well, hold your horses for a second because I got to get you into the story. Okay. Hold your Kentucky Derby horses. I'm holding them. <laughs> and and don't don't uh, don't dope them up I with any of those steroids. My hat in my other hand, my drink in the other. We're good. <laughs> you got horses in one hand, hat, drink. You got a lot going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're talking about Vril. So the story starts when the narrator visits a mine and meets a mining engineer who has discovered a secret road lit by gas lamps deep inside the earth. So imagine that. Nope. <laughs> I'm a James. That's an immediate oh, no. no. Like... <laughs> James is digging down in his sandbox and all of a sudden he comes across this road that's been lit. I just turn around. It's... I'm not oh, playing nope. anymore. I said this, this didn't happen. <laughs> All the right. engineer, worrying that this might be gnomes or fiends, is much like James and refuses to go any further and returns to the surface. That's the fear. Those are the There's top the two. Got it. Yep. But the narrator, who Lytton never named, well, yeah, who Lytton never names, I think that's true. We'll find out if I'm right about that as we <laughs> keep going. These 19th century guys... Uh, so the narrator talks to the engineer and try- and gets the engineer to go back with him. But the engineer should have listened to James from the future. Mm. The engineer takes a bad fall during their descent to the bottom of the chasm and dies. Oh, okay. But nothing is wasted on the journey to the center of the earth because immediately a giant alligator-like reptile emerges and eats the engineer and scares the narrator off. No. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That's what I knew was going to happen. I knew it, and I didn't want it to be true, and it happened. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, the narrator nursing a head wound proceeds alone into this underworld approaching the building and witnessing species extinct since the deluge aka noah's flood a humanoid figure approaches it reminded me of symbolical images of genius or demon that are seen on the etruscan faces or limbed on the walls of eastern sepulchers images that borrow the outlines of man and are yet of another race. It was tall, not gigantic, but tall as the tallest men below the height of giants. Its chief covering seemed to me to be composed of large wings folded over its breast and reaching to its knees. The rest of its attire was composed of an under tunic and leggings of some thin fibrous material. It wore on its head a kind of tiara that shone with jewels and carried in its right hand a slender staff of bright metal like polished steel. Why is this like literally journey to the center of the earth? Like I'm so confused. Uh, there's similarities for sure, except it gets super magic pretty well, soon. Yeah, I don't think the rock <laughs> got that magic. Was the rock in that? I, I just assumed. I don't even know. I, I believe okay. so. If it's about digging down through the rocks, you ought to have the rock. <laughs> okay. It's know. terrible. It's terrible. Please cut all. Love it. <laughs> nah, I'm keeping it. Okay. The beardless face. So the man is beardless, by the way, much like the rock. Hmm. Sphinx-like, endowed with strange and mysterious powers, inimical. In, inimical says a 19th century word. Inimical to man. Equal? Is that what that means? What is, what is uh, in, 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 inimical? No, it's beyond us. It's beyond us. In, in, we don't have these kinds of powers. Inimical. 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 It's tough to say. Yeah, can't do it. It's the N and the M and all those I's. The stranger ushers the narrator into a great columned building. Inside, the narrator discovers that these men don't speak English, and he can't identify the strange tongue they're communicating with. They heal him. Although it'd be weirder, I think, if they just, like, spoke Dutch. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Anyway. They heal him, curing his head wound through their magical touch. At night, he witnesses the underground people play by flying on wings that carry them aloft without flapping. Together, the underworld people join each other in a kind of aerial improvised dance. Now, much like I I, I imagine James would be if he was watching all this, the narrator begins to lose it. Imagine... Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. James didn't even want to be down here in the first place. And now he's watching aerial acrobatics without even any planes or anything. This is where you draw the line. <laughs> You're not more relaxed <laughs> at so seeing that? Here. I would be a little bit relieved. You made it this far. You're well, here. Olivia, I'll tell you why you would be relieved, because the narrator thinks he's witnessing some sort of demonic Sabbath. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not? Yeah. You're down for it. Yeah. And he lunges for his host. His host's name is Aflin. 
uh, he l- lunges for his throat. So this is a sort of bizarre moment in the novel. <laughs> this guy is sort of like taken him in and fed him and not killed him. And then just he's just watching people fly around and he tries to choke this guy to death. <laughs> <laughs> <What>? <laughs> that yeah. is weird. This is weird, yeah. But uh, A. Flynn is not concerned because he jolts him to the ground with an electric shock, sort of like a taser, even though the man does not have any taser on his person. What? <laughs> Are we sure? Is that explicitly said that he didn't have a taser? No, he has Vril. We're getting he's, He has some Vril power. So A. Flynn remains calm throughout the entire thing and gently places a hand on the narrator's forehead. Next thing the narrator knows, he passes out and wakes up, and these people are able to understand English. Or so he thinks. Do you know what's actually happened with the head touch? Is he just speaking their language? or? Yes, yeah, yeah. he's learned to understand their language while asleep. That's some so they have alien shit right there. Yeah, they can get, while you're unconscious, your brain can process and learn a full language. Damn. They've been trying to tell me that on the TV. That is true. <laughs> People do say that, though, right? Like, that you're supposed to be able yeah. to do that? Like, learn Japanese while like you're sleeping. How? I'm like, I don't know. If they said on the TV, uh, this is Biff, and uh, if you come to Biff's house and he grabs you by the head and then you take a nap, you will know French, then it's like this. Well, I gotta do that, because... <laughs> <laughs> So uh, they've got this power. It's the power of healing. It's the power of teaching languages. And it's operating at least in part through the subconscious. I should call it electricity, except that it comprehends in its manifold branches other forces of nature, to which in our scientific nomenclature, differing names are assigned, such as magnetism, galvanism, etc. These people consider that in Viril, they have arrived at the unity in natural energetic agencies, which has been conjured by many philosophers above ground. Oh, so Vril is the what happened to him to be able to learn the other the language? Is that what you're saying? V- Vril is the force that allowed him to learn the language. That's a oh, great okay. word. Like, like gravity. I get it. Like the force, yeah. but Vril. Uh, yeah, like electromagnetism or something. Yeah, it's some unidentified force by us. Okay. Uh, our narrator cites Fa- uh, Faraday's belief that all forces of nature have a common form or that they can transform into each other. Faraday, of course, an experimenter with, uh, well, scientist uh, experimented with electricity in the 19th century. Uh, let's see. Vril is also used to provide light that grows the plants they live on underground. Remember, we're underground, so we have no photosynthesis. Uh, but we can now because we have Vril power. It also powers automata, or robots, who do all of the domestic service, sort of like Rosie on the Jetsons. Oh, okay, there's robots now. That's cool. Yep, there's robots. They had that robot back then? They had that word? Well, they had automata. Yeah, that's what he called them, automata. Wait, really? They, like, had some kind of... That's so weird to think about. They had a concept, yeah, for for robots. Although the word itself is, what, Russian? I don't know. Oh, I didn't... You know, that, that makes a lot of, of sense. I believe, <laughs> I believe it's Russian for laborer. Oh, oh, wow. Oh, my God. What? Sorry, I just had a Robot, moment. Yeah. I just had like a a moment. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Sorry. Automata, though, is that would have been the way the British would have talked about these creatures or these entities, I guess. In addition to these creative capacities, Vril can also prove destructive. This fluid is capable of being raised and disciplined into the mightiest agency over all forms of matter, animate or inanimate. It can destroy like the flash of lightning, yet differently applied. It can replenish or invigorate life, heal and preserve, and on it, they chiefly rely for the cure of disease, or rather, for enabling the physical organization to reestablish the due equilibrium of its natural powers, and thereby to cure itself. If army met army, and both had command of this agency, it could be but to the annihilation of each. The age of war was therefore gone. So the tasing sensation was the the vril, right? It's it's a light vril. A a light dosing of vril, is that? A light vril dose, yeah. It can do all these different things. You can like, it's like Play-Doh. It's like magical Play-Doh. Okay. If if, if gravity was Play-Doh, you can mold it into many different things. Mm -hmm. So it can teach you a language, it can heal you, it can shock you, or it can destroy an army. Hmm. Oh, and you, you can fly too, remember that? Oh, sick, okay. 
The people generally wield the power of Vril using a Vril staff. Oh. Yeah, you get a stick, just like Harry Potter. Nice. Uh, big stick, bigger stick. Yeah, he had a wand, so <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, a no, no. You... tiny stick. <laughs> all, all my uh, coming race people, they have big old sticks. Hell yeah. So the, the Vril staff is a tool which tempers itself to the skills and abilities of its handler. Like a wand? <laughs> like a wand, Literally yeah. Literally tips it <laughs> Yeah. But bigger, <laughs> but I can't say enough right. bigger. yeah, yeah. yeah. These staffs are most powerful in the hands of the youngest children, who can reduce to ashes a capital twice as vast as London. Mm. So you sort of like, as you age, you lose some of your virile power. That makes sense. So the strongest ones are the youngest ones, just like, you know, the human body, I guess. Mm. Women, incidentally, also have greater ability to use virile than men. No, that's right. This reflects the prevalence of young female mediums following the dawn of spiritualist mediumship 20 years before Lytton finished his coming race. Women and more feminine men were believed to have inherently more mystical ability. Vril, after all, is also a mystical force, accessed and controlled by higher degrees of consciousness. Using a variety of forms of trance states, the underground people communicate telepathically and rapidly exchange knowledge as when the narrator learned to speak like them. Oh, okay. You guys mentioned aliens, but this kind of thing really does feel like sci-fi novels and sci-fi movies. They use a lot of these tropes yeah. that, was, that were in this novel. After describing the upper world to his host with its democratic voting processes and various arts and scientists, sciences, so in other words, uh, there reaches a point in the story where the narrator's just like, hey, you guys want to know about what it's like up there where I'm from? And they're like, yeah, sure. <laughs> they're not wildly interested because they're doing so super well down yeah, there, why, but whatever. Why would they care? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're being polite. Yeah, like somebody wants to show you pictures of their, you know, living room or something. Look, we redesigned the whatever. Oh, yeah. I oh, no way. can't wait to see that. <laughs> Look, I made a tart last night. Whatever. So th they're being polite. So <laughs> he starts to describe <laughs> democracy to them and art and science. Which, of course, is ridiculous because they have magic. So yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> they're not going to be impressed by Newtonian physics. <laughs> but so after his host hears him talk about all this stuff, he makes him promise not to share it with anyone else without his permission. Then they seal the promise by the host placing the narrator's hand on his forehead and the host pla placing his hand on the narrator's chest, which incidentally is what I would like us to do from now on in the alchemical actors. It's going to be a little make awkward at first to know who's supposed to do what, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. we'll get Once over it. Once we get it. the hang of yeah. it. Yeah. Once we get the hang of it, doing it in front of people who don't know what we're up to, it'll be really impressive. Some people are just head just... people. Yeah. Some people are heart people. You got to figure it out. <laughs> right. <laughs> it'll look like we've been doing it for years. Okay. So <clears throat> this is the ways of our people. This promise is largely for the narrator's own good, the promise not to share anything that he told about the upper world. Uh, since the underground people, if they heard about the society the narrator has traveled from, from would regard him as a barbarian. <laughs> yeah. I don't like that word. Barbarian? Yeah. What would you prefer? Like a moron. <laughs> 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 I feel like those are different connotations, but you know. Yeah, there can be very intelligent barbarians. <laughs> yeah, you know, like this. I don't know, like the Visigoths. Isn't like the etymology of the word like that? It sounds like their like language sounds like bar 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 bar. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Wait, wait, we talked about. I didn't know that. Maybe James and I. I feel like I've had this conversation, including yeah, James, somewhere. I think so. I think so because I don't know that. Like, I mean, it makes me feel like it's like ah, oh, you just. You're just being ignorant. But like, <laughs> but like I get the word, but it, I always think about it. Every time I hear it, I'm like, well, that's unfair. it's like the same connotation as uh, like savage, right? Kind of. Yeah. It's like the yeah. same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Savage was that's used. That's a little worse pretty, probably, but. Yeah. It was used more by uh, colonists, right. I think, in the United States to describe Native people Barbarian, I always think of like the Visigoths and yeah. the Huns and stuff, European barbarians. 
I mean, like these guys, they they have like cool technology. They got real, but like they're not very woke. It seems like no, they're not especially <laughs> woke. James, you will. Uh, you have, we've only begun to scratch the surface of how unwoke they but are. Like, All if, right. you, <laughs> if you have magic, how woke do you need to be? That might be it. Well, that'll be a qu- save that question for the end, Olivia. We'll revisit that. Oh God, that's gonna <laughs> open up so much of a wormhole. Oh, it's gonna get dark. So the underground people are called the Anna. Males are also called Anna, and the females are called Gi. So sort of like humans, we have Mankind. man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, even though I say humankind to be gender inclusive. The organizing principle of Vrilya or Avril, their word for civilization. So civilization and the word Vril are the same. Oh. You see what I mean? So their word for civilization is Vrilya or Avril. Okay. People of the Vril. It's based on the existence of the powerful Vril, and all systems of thought tend toward unity, a single first cause and principle, which is sort of like Vril, which is that unifying force. Everybody's a vegetarian, uh, and they practice a form of ahimsa with a big asterisk, uh, uh, sorry, with one big asterisk that we'll get into later. Uh, so by ahimsa, I mean no harm. They try not to harm anything. Oh, oh, okay. There is no war, no crime, no police, and very little need for arbitration. So no lawyers. Hmm. They are ruled by a tur, T-U-R, the tur. This is a single leader who resigns at the onset of old age, which is the opposite of how the United States works. Yeah, <laughs> that's, not, yeah that's not a very fine line, though. Uh, the onset of old age. Yeah, Imagine I mean, wrinkle room and gray area there. There's supposed to be these these very rational people who are like, "Yep, I'm too old for this," and then you just quit. Oh, must be nice. Yeah. <laughs> There are no insignia or honors for this office or for any others. So the Tur also doesn't get a fancy hat or a fancy throne or anything fancy. It's basically the opposite of the alchemical actors where everybody needs a title. Uh, (laughs) There is no poverty or competition. Some work harder than others and accrue more wealth, but all have everything they desire. It's a socialist paradise. A college of sages helps to make important decisions, from which the Tur occasionally draws counselors, sort of like Plato's uh, scholar leader characters. Uh, Children and teenagers are employed to keep an eye on the fault line and the cracks in the earth to watch for volcanic activity and to hunt down species who trouble the crops and threaten on a life. That is the coolest summer job ever as a teen. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, it's like Israel when they make you join the military. Oh, yeah, for like a couple of years. Basically, the teens do all the tough work, and then they retire in their 20s to hang out and watch other people fly around. Huh. Pretty fun. <laughs> Women are physically larger and stronger than the men. Woo! Sorry. <laughs> so like Amazons, and have greater control over the Vril. The female is the wooing party. Woo! So you're going to have to woo. <laughs> uh, and there are almost no unmarried women. The logic to this is that women have greater interest in love and, said sh- and so should be the ones to pursue males. Okay, that's fine. It's, it's the 19th century. This does not make the women domineering. Rather, they concede to the men whatever the men need in order to secure a relationship okay. and tend to appease wow. the men for fear of driving the man off. Nope, I'm out now. Well, I might pull you back. Women are dominant and better than men at almost everything. (sighs) That is worth it, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) So anything a man might attempt to accomplish, a woman can do better. And for that reason, women are fairly subservient in the domestic sphere. Mm, I'm I'm torn. It's it's like a perfect recipe for peace there. So because you're better at everything, you're nice to the man. Oh, God. Yeah, okay. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in again. I'm in. (laughs) This, in my opinion, could be a regretful critique of patriarchal dominance in all spheres of Victorian England in which men are both sexually domineering and dominate society. That's interesting. Yeah, I think that, you know, if we imagined a society, because now we're in this, you know, gender fluid world and everything's far more complicated than it was in Victorian England in many ways. And I guess in some ways less complicated, but Hmm. picture an environment where the men, you know, are running all this stuff but the women are making the sexual choices. 
so in a way it like it r- removes a culture of you know rape and predation and creeping like all that goes away because the women are running the sexual sphere mm-hmm. and the domestic sphere so i, I what i think what what bulwer lytton's trying to say with this is that if women are in charge of the domestic sphere why are they not also in charge of the sexual sphere why are men dominating women in that area because the family is supposed to be their thing okay you know what i mean yeah, i get it so they should run the mating process i guess it was progressive for the old school yeah, I mean, he's an old man when he's writing this in 1871. He's, he's uh, thinking progressively about gender as far as he's able to. Strict gender roles and conservative marriage laws, uh, we have to remember, played a powerful role in Victorian society. And Lytton himself had a fairly complex and dark relationship with Victorian social codes surrounding marriage and gender. So while I just said nice things about him, this is going to go badly. Oh, God. Getting back to his biography. So this is actual his life, bulwer Lytton. In 1827, he married Rosina Doyle Wheeler against his mother's wishes. They had two children before separating in 1833, and then they divorced in 1836. The reasons for their separation may have included Lytton's infidelity, also his political career, which pulled him away from house and home. Hmm. Rosina published a book-length satire that was clearly at Lytton's expense and spoke out against his candidacy when he ran for public office. Hmm. We can't imagine that in the U.S., an ex-wife getting involved in a political race. Hmm. Lytton threatened her publishers, cut her off financially, denied her access to her children, and finally had her committed briefly to an asylum. What the ever-loving f*** is that? (laughs) That's some 19th century shit right there. Oh my god. Before a public outcry brought her home again. Oh, You know, if he had social media, he would just have made a post about it, he would have been done with it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh god. So there was actually a protest campaign to bring the woman home. But yeah, we have to bear in mind, maybe I've said this on other episodes, that it was very easy to commit somebody in the 19th century. For sure. The yellow wallpaper is like a huge short story that I feel like everyone in college has to read because of that. (laughs) Like Women in particular, it was very easy to commit a woman. Because frenzy and hysteria and all that bullshit. Yeah. Well, you know, the asylum system is... A big business like this is the beginning this is when the asylum is a nursing home and a convalescent home it's everything yeah so if you're a drunk go to the asylum if you're old go to the asylum if you're whatever if you're schizophrenic go to the asylum everybody goes to the asylum if you're just annoying go to the asylum right so anyway he tried to commit her for being annoying didn't work out um and, and, and i think this provides some background to the complex relationships that Lytton's male protagonists tended to have with women we're about to get there and Lytton's somewhat wistful desire to let the women choose since clearly his strong choice for ms wheeler over his mother's objections did not work very well at all so i think he's at least self-aware well the, and then to just do all that shit to her it's like what yeah i don't know yeah yeah he knew he knew by the end by 1871 he knew that <laughs> he had made mistakes. Mm. I think that's clear in uh, coming race, anyhow. The Anna's opinion on God are definite, with all underground people having complete and total faith in the existence of a benevolent creator. Which I think is the opposite. Like, if we think of this advanced sci-fi society today, they would be atheists, right? Yeah. But for Bulwer Lytton, it's the foregone conclusion that they just have complete faith in God. They were like monotheist, just one God. Uh, yeah, there is a creator force, yeah. Huh. Yep. But their ideas on the nature of that creator are fairly modest. Since a finite being like an An cannot possibly define the infinite, so when he endeavors to realize an idea of the divinity, he only reduces the divinity into an An like himself. During the later ages, therefore, all theological speculations, though not forbidden, have been so discouraged as to have fallen utterly into disuse. So because they could only think of God in human terms, they just gave up. Hmm. Okay. God exists, but we can't say anything about God. It's basically my ideology. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> I get that one. That's relatable. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It's a very uh, Occult Confessions vibe. Hmm. Much of Vrilya's religion sounds a lot like Blavatsky's theosophy, which is somewhat curious, given that Helena Blavatsky would not even begin a public career in any shape or form until three years after Lytton's novel was published. There are clear Vedic undertones to much of what Lytton has to say about the, uh, people, the underground people's views on the afterlife, accentuated by a later note that, much like the Hindus, 
the Vrilya cremate their dead. Oh. How about that? Yeah. I mean, this is not a Western practice. Right. This, the Theosophical Society introduces it to the United States. But here he puts it among these people. So he really views them, I, I think, as quasi-Hindu. I mean, also, if you're underground, what else are you going to do with bodies? Right? That's yeah. true. I mean, try to expand. He's just running into dead bodies. That's no good. I guess you could <laughs> bury them deeper underground, but that seems... You're already in the place where we put our bodies. Right. Ugh. Britain was uh, well underway in its project to establish India as a colony, uh, as I mentioned, and the German-born British scholar Max Muller, with whom Lytton was very much familiar, was in the process of translating his sacred books of the East. So there was a lot of importation of Indian philosophy into the United Kingdom. The stranger connection to Blavatsky's oeuvre is airships, which Blavatsky described as a regular means of transportation for the Atlanteans of the fourth race. As longtime listeners know, one of my favorite passages in The Secret Doctrine describes how the divine kings stole the airships of the dark sorcerers of Atlantis to escape the cataclysm that was to submerge the continent. Lytton described the Vrilya's airships as aerial vehicles constructed of light substances, looking more like boats or pleasure vessels than balloons, with helms and rudders and large wings that operated as paddles. Also a central machine, all of this worked by Vril power. Remember these boats well, because we'll come back to them in a future episode in this series when we talk about Atlantis and serpent people. <laughs> Woo! Love that shit. <sighs> I think I'm super excited for that. Moving on. In a gallery of portraits, the narrator discovers three full-length paintings created by an ancient philosopher depicting the man himself and his ancestors, namely his grandfather and great-grandfather. The narrator is amazed to see the philosopher's webbed hands. <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> the philosopher's grandfather's frog-like features and the philosopher's great-grandfather, who looked just like a giant frogman. Okay. Among the the philosoph this particular philosopher's many pithy sayings is, "Humble yourselves, my descendants. The father of your race was a twat." <laughs> oh, All <no>. right. <laughs> <laughs> twat in this context means tadpole. Oh. Is that where that comes from? Uh, yeah. But, but believe it You're or not, you're just calling yeah. someone a tadpole. Pretty much. Um, incredible. Absolutely incredible. <laughs> British people have the best, they should say the best so, things. Is that, is that kind of like saying somebody's immature? You're a twat, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess. You're like yeah, a young yeah. baby, a baby frog. Baby frog. I've never had context for no. it. In ancient times, philosophers wrangled over whether the On people were descended from frogs or whether frogs represented an evolutionary improvement over the On. Think about that. <laughs> Frogs pretty cool. <laughs> are the are people are the underground people descended from frogs, or are the frogs descended from the underground people? <laughs> That's a new one. Fro <laughs> so this is the art the logic here. Frogs are not only better swimmers <laughs> than the on people, but they are more adaptable by virtue of their being amphibious. We're not amphibious. Wouldn't it be cool if we were amphibious? It would be cool. I've been complaining about that for a while. That one history <laughs> channel documentary tried to tell us we were all related to mermaids, so Right? Yeah, they got people believing that. My really father in law believed that. Oh yeah, people really did. <laughs> I had to point it point out at the end how they anyhow. Yeah. They were also just better to hang out with frogs. Right? Come on. Who wouldn't want to hang out with a frog? Yeah, okay. They're pretty hey, chill. Yeah. It's the whole premise of the Muppets. Have you seen this? The frogs fighting for for like a like a tree branch or whatever. They'd be fighting. They just kind of wrestle around. Like, and then they what happens? They're incapable of hurting each other. So then <laughs> kind of like, like, okay, you did better than me. I'll go over here. So, so historically among the On people, the issue of whether they were descended from frogs or whether frogs were descended from them led to war and ruled by de despotic frog people before Vril was discovered and the On decided that it didn't matter one way or the other. Like their ambivalence about the nature of God, the Vrilya are content to give up most philosophical and historical arguments on the basis that it doesn't matter much since they've perfected society. So who cares? <laughs> yeah, okay. Take that, history professors. Take that, history podcast. <laughs> Whether frogs evolve from them or they evolve from frogs is a question they're just going to leave unanswered. So, 
The Virilia, as I'm, I guess you're, you're, I hope you're picking up, are intensely averse to contention or argument of any kind. If the terror comes across a question he can't answer, he puts it to three members of the College of Sages, but they do not debate the issue. They draw lots, and one of them resolves it. <laughs> I kind of like that for some reason. <laughs> yep, yep. I would love it if we answered questions that yeah. way. <laughs> uh, there's an argument going on right now in higher education uh, about whether or not admission to harvard and princeton should be done by lottery for the same reason oh really that all the people who apply are basically equally good and can all get in so why are we acting like there's any difference between them? people would lose their ever-loving minds if they made that a lottery (laughs) but could you imagine going through high school and not having to like live like an admissions director at some college wants you to live yeah yeah Yeah, it'd be an improvement on society anyhow Debate leads to argument. Check out the Chronicle of Higher Education. Those of you who want to know more about this argument, it's been going on for weeks now on that, in that publication. So debate leads to argument, and argument does not produce the best solution since people simply commit to their own opinions, forming a camp or a faction, as is happening in the Chronicle of Higher Education, rather than seek the best solution. This is the argument. So one person is preferable to make any controversial choice in order to avoid another controversy. So if it were the three of us, we'd just be like, okay, today Olivia makes our decisions. Tomorrow, James will decide, and then Rob will decide, and we just rotate. That's really nice. Uh, No argument. Can't argue on Olivia's day. It's Olivia's turn. That's so funny. I accept that, Olivia. Yeah, I mean, I accept (laughs) it. James is ready to live that way. I think it'd be fun. It'd be like Always Sunny when they have, like, Mac Day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It'd be just like that. Yeah, but more democratic? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> hopefully more productive yeah. <laughs> so, like philosophy fiction is considered an antiquated and useless pursuit literally all the topics of today's podcast although the narrator's host's wife is described as passing the time by reading ancient romances stories of people tragically suffering as a result of their intense passions are difficult for modern vrilya to relate to and impossible for them to conjure given how placid their lives have become without conflict or hierarchy furthermore there's not much motivation for vrilya to make art of any kind since there's no desire for fame among their people oh what? that's interesting debate <laughs> art it seems at least in this world is made by people seeking contentment and not people who have achieved it so if you're content you have no reason to make art and these frog children are just too chill to write a good spaghetti western are they saying like art is inherently like materialistic or like it's more about ego i don't disagree on the principle that art is about conflict or storytelling is about conflict he's also in victorian england yeah Mm -hmm. and it's like like, and, like, he's an artist, which is weird. Like, he's a writer. He's saying in part that art is about fame, yeah. Yeah. And he's like, these people, yeah, are about, okay. But so I don't know. Did don't he think have, that really like, fame at this point, though? Like. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, the, the, the public protested him putting his wife in an asylum, so he okay, was a pretty right, famous right. guy. <laughs> I mean, like, art's what happens when, we, when humans have free time to, that, like, we don't have to spend satisfying our, like, hunger and, and shelter right. and stuff like right? historically like, yeah kind of i think that you know bull Litton ultimately agrees with you he doesn't agree with his vrilia people but the vrilia people would say you know like playing video games and stuff like this is what we should be doing with our time not trying to create things oh okay okay i see i've lost the argument there with oh. the, he was talking about the vrilia yeah it's not really <laughs> it's not bull oh, yeah. himself oh, yeah. per se that because reason. <laughs> yeah he's he's gonna have opinions about this mm. let's hear some All history showed the wholesale immorality of the human race, the complete disregard, even by the most renowned amongst them, of the laws which they acknowledged to be essential to their own and the general happiness and well-being. But the severest critic of the frog race could not detect in their manners a single aberration from the moral law tactily recognized by themselves. Now here's where it gets juicy. Aflin's daughter, Z, develops a romantic attachment to the narrator, and he tells her father and his host, Aflin, about her crush. Aflin does not split hairs, saying, I grieve for you, because such a marriage would be against the Algloran, or good of the community, for the children of such a marriage would adulterate the race. 
They might even come into the world with the teeth of carnivorous animals. This could not be allowed. Z is Gi, cannot be controlled, but you, as a Tish, can be destroyed. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so here's where the story really drives home its point about purity. Intellectual purity, spiritual purity, and genetic purity. The staid tranquility and homogeneity of these underground people is, uh, as I think Olivia and James have been uh, unpacking here, sort of a nightmare. The virtuous and peaceful life of the people, which, while new to me, had seemed so wholly a contrast to the contentions, the passions, the vices of the upper world, now began to oppress me with a sense of dullness and monotony. Even the serene tranquility of the lustrous air preyed on my spirits. I longed for a change, even to winter, or storm, or darkness. Uh, James was sort of getting at this when, right? Like, what is life without art? What are we doing? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I suggested playing video games, but who the hell would make them? That's a good point. (laughs) Right. I was also tying back to that same premise of like kind of you escape one thing to be to build like a new prison for yourself. Like oh. it's like, oh, like they've, they've they've transcended these things that we struggle with. But then it's still like there's still yeah. stuff to work on. You've created a new issue. The great feelings that motivate us to solve or explore terrific mysteries, to create something truly beautiful or podcastastic, or to love and be loved profoundly, regardless of obstacle do not seem to move these underground people. In fact, they are generally unmoved by anything and strive to remain unmoved. This is perhaps why the narrator, a stranger in this strange land, proves so desirable to his host's daughter, as well as the daughter of the community's leader. Z makes arrangements to marry the narrator through a promise to have a sexless soul union. Okay. Hmm. That's that's fun for a lot of people. <laughs> I don't <laughs> I do think there are a lot of people involved in sexless unions, but I don't know if they would characterize them as fun. Well, I guess I'm thinking like asexual people, this would be chill. Well, yeah, yeah. This is like a ideal small group. really for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh this union because sexless would not pollute the race. So, hooray. Oh. Hmm. But the narrator has gotten into even deeper hot water flirting with the Tur's daughter. Guess what? What are you doing? Yes, not only does he have this girl who's interested in him, but now he's he's hitting on this other girl. Oh. The princess, as he calls her, would clearly have gotten him destroyed because she, unlike the chaste Z, very much wanted to bang. So the princess was super horny. Mm. He will not agree to marry Z because he fears he can offer no happiness in this world and that she would be a terrible danger to his own world. His vision of bringing Z into New York is a bit like what we might imagine it would be like to bring a nuclear bomb in a suitcase into the city. Oh, he could he could never leave with her. He'd have to stay there, right? Yeah, he'd have to stay there, but they might put him down. Ah, uh, right. Oppression. Yeah, like a dog. Even if we, you know, you, you, the, the nuclear bomb analogy, by, what, by that I mean, even if we brought it into the city without the plan to detonate it, the fact that we have it there at all seems very irresponsible. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So she's like a nuclear bomb. Just having her there is a bad idea. Ultimately, the Tur's daughter, remember he's our leader, reveals her passion to her father. I really want to bang the barbarian. And he calls for the narrator to be destroyed, naturally. <laughs> Z catches wind of the plan, and although the aperture through which the narrator had descended was closed, meaning that little hole that he dropped through, uh, and they closed it up to prevent any further incursion into this underground kingdom from the above-ground people, Z opens up a new hole for him to escape through using her power, and with her wings, transports him back to the human mine, and then she returns to her homeland. Mm. The twin dangers which doom any chance of the narrator mating with a gi from the netherworld are, number one, the community's eugenics, and number two, their command of Vril as a massively destructive force. Lil, uh, Lytton is practically prophetic in identifying these forces as the greatest threat to humanity in the case of eugenics. 
these people, descended from or to frogs, had intermarried and blended races actively for years, but had since arrived at what they believed to be an ideal genetic composition. A progressive program became conservative and even fascistic. While they faultlessly avoided harming any being that did not threaten their well-being, they also mercilessly destroyed whole communities and would have destroyed the narrator himself if any threat was perceived. So there are these barbarians on the outskirts, and they will cut a barbarian. This, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, I mean, we're, we're talking about the Holocaust here, right? In a That's way. That's what I was just yeah. thinking about. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, this is a eugenic program. We're not only talking about the Holocaust, but we're, of course, talking about the atom bomb with, you know, the power of the Vril. I mean, the power of the Vril might be Edward uh, Bulwer-Lytton seeing into the future the power of the atom. The, it really, atomic power is the power that holds together the nucleus of the atom, which is intense. It's like many times that of gravity or electromagnetism. They're not even comparable. This, That's really Vril. This is 18-something, eight, right? 1871. Okay. Yeah, jeez. Yeah. That's crazy. So the atom bomb wasn't made yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> it, the atom bomb would not be made for 40, 30, 70 years. And Einstein would not even really b- work out the equation for the power within the atom f- for 50 years. Well, I was thinking the Holocaust hasn't even happened either. For This guy is, he predicts all of these things, really, with this novel. Yeah. The story concludes with the narrator near death, perhaps as a result of his exposure to the exotic and apparently volatile Vril among the Anna living deep beneath the surface of the earth. Lytton doesn't say either way, but he worries for the day when a race who considers itself so superior, possessed as it is with such power, should emerge into the sunlight. The more I think of a people calmly developing in regions excluded from our sight and deemed uninhabitable by our sages, powers surpassing our most disciplined modes of force and virtues to which our life, social and political, becomes antagonistic in proportion as our civilization advances, the more devoutly I pray that ages may yet elapse before their emerge into sunlight our inevitable destroyers. Being, however, frankly told by my physician that I am afflicted by a complaint which, though it gives little pain and no perceptible notice of its encroachments, may at any moment be fatal. I have thought it to my duty to my fellow man to place on record these four warnings of the coming race. Wow, I mean, I think he got some stuff right. You know, some stuff rang for me. Like when he said, he was saying that uh, everybody was vegetarian. I'm like, I could see that being in the future. <laughs> uh, maybe. I feel like there's more people eating vegetarian now than there were, like, you know. In the Victorian so, era? Because who was vegetarian yeah, yeah. then? I mean, ultimately, yeah, there are things about the coming race that are, I think, are, are potentially good. But ultimately, the coming race is a, is a nightmare. It's yeah. the Nazis. I was going to say, it's the Aryan race. I mean, kind of right, low-key. Yeah, he he. Before there was even a, a glint in Hitler's mom's eye, he he saw these things on the horizon. It's amazing. It's an amazing novel, and I have since I was in college, I have sort of hewed to a kind of Buddhist mindset that we should pursue detachment as far as we're able to. But this book. And I just read this because I'm interested in Bulwer Lytton, but this book made me question that in ways that I've never have before. Detachment truly seems kind of horrifying mm. in this world. Well, it's almost like there's always going to be another, another thing. Like there'll always be another problem. Like even if they like, you know, are, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really the challenge to Buddhism, which is almost baked in, and the Buddha, I think, might even be, you know, apt to acknowledge this, is that we become attached to our own detachment. Mm. And that becomes its own block on the road to enlightenment, sort of like Zanoni. The, you know, the transcendence becomes a new block. This passionlessness it becomes a block, a block from being truly enlightened. We convince ourselves that we're so enlightened that in fact we're not. We're just boring and horrible. Like they won't even make art because it's like they're above it. 
They lack compassion and feeling. Yeah. Compassion and passion. Mm. That's not good. What's the point of living? Right. Let's gong it out into the order of confessors. Corbo84 says Rob is a professional. Thank you. That's true. And thanks for speaking truth to madness, he says. Yeah, thanks, Robin. We don't thank you enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> today we're sort of, uh, yeah, we just got through the whole conspiracy series. Like, I'm trying to move on from speaking truth to madness, but maybe I do do that even in uh, with Edward bulwer Lytton. The anonymous Canadian says it's more than just folks sharing facts. It's well-researched anonymous and anonymous wishes uh, that anonymous had a class like this in university. No, that's fun. Okay. So the discord's doing things. Uh, Tom Hanks, for example, has been a big (laughs) feature of the discord. (laughs) D and D for losers was watching the internet in the time of Q and says there was a huge exodus of young adults from the movement uh, when they implicated Tom Hanks. Uh, they could also follow sex trafficking. Uh, oh, so uh, Day and D for Losers is basically making the point that the Q people could follow the sex trafficking, the demons, and the Trumpiness, but Tom Hanks was a bridge too far. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Good nice. He, he says Tom Hanks is Mr. Rogers, literally played Mr. Rogers, but uh, because he was also in the Snow- Polar Express that a lot of people in their 20s anyway identify him that way. Hmm. On Discord, our friend Men, Men W pointed out that Hanks was in an early Satanic Panic movie po- called Mazes and Monsters. We also heard via email from our friend Mike uh, about the Mazes and Monsters movie. So Tom Hanks' early career, it's like 83, 84, was in a movie called Mazes and Monsters, which is basically about a Dungeons and Dragons game in which the fantasy turns deadly. Very cool. Yeah, I feel he, like it's been done on like at least 20 Jumanji, times. Jumanji, but... Like, but... <laughs> yeah. Well, like it's still that's it. I'm down. I, 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 I'll watch them. I thought I knew my Hanks, but no, I have not seen that. So that's going to be the movie night for the alchemical actors. We got to watch Mazes and Monsters. Deep Cut Saturday. Huh. <laughs> uh, our sources today included both the novel Zanoni and The Coming Race, also The Life of Edward Bulwer, first Lord Lytton of London, uh, by his grandson, Earl of Lytton, Victor Alexander George Robert Bulwer Lytton, second Earl of Lytton. Oy. All right, Olivia, get us out of here. I hereby adjourn and declare close this meeting of the Secret Order of Alchemical Actors till such a time as we get together and do it again. We got so many people doing voices for us today. We had Brandon Walls, we had Luke Kinnaman, we had Andrew Mims, we had Sean Priest, the whole Voice Boys crew. Voice Boys! We want to thank uh, all those friends. We want to thank all of you for listening. My name is Rob C. Thompson, joined today by Olivia Literal, Grandmaster of the Order. Goodbye, beautiful people. Captain of the Table, James Kaplanges. This was fun. Let's do it again. <laughs> Let's do it again. Let's do it again. We're going to. We're going to hang in the 19th century for a little while, uh, hang out with Pascal Beverly Randolph. We're going to meet a guy named Ethan Allen Hitchcock, who was a big war hero, uh, and a general who wrote about alchemy. Oh. And then we're going to do some Lovecraft stuff before uh, we flip it on over to Olivia in our fictional occult series. Nice. So thanks for listening. We'll catch you all next time here on Occult Confessions. Bye.